In the case of scientists, you have to ask the question, does science get harnessed enough in order to really create the social and policy changes that we might be looking for? And if the answer to that is no, which it clearly is, then what can we do to try to make that connection stronger? Hello, and welcome to our Buzz and Behavioral Medicine podcast series. Today, we'll be talking with Dr. Kelly Burnell. Dr. Burnell is an internationally known scholar whose seminal work has shaped the field of obesity. You know the term toxic food environment? Well, that was a term made popular by Dr. Burnell. In this podcast, you'll hear about how Dr. Burnell started his career and how his work led him to developing an approach he calls strategic science a method that has been used to inform policies like calorie labeling at point of purchase. So while you paid for the full seat, you're only going to need the edge. This is going to be an eye-opening discussion with one of SBM's most influential public health leaders. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? We'll talk a little bit about what it was like as a young doctor. Well, you weren't a doctor then, young Kelly Brunel, <laughs> before you got your doctorate. Tell us a little bit about how that life experience informed uh, who you are and what you chose to, to do in your, in your career? The, the answer to that question really begins in high school in, in South Bend, Indiana. And at that time, the major thing on the world scene that just was dominating everything was the Vietnam War. There were some people in my high school who were interested in kind of the politics of things and these big, broad social issues. Not a lot, but I happened to be one of them. So I followed these political issues really carefully, and I, it made me yearn to do something that um, where I could create some difference in the world around these things. Um, I grew up in the shadow of Notre Dame. Um, I got admitted to Notre Dame, but my family didn't have the money to send me there. I would have had to live at home, and that didn't sound like a very good idea. And so I went off to Purdue, and Purdue was uh, engineering and agriculture school primarily, and I was, I was really interested in science, and so I went uh, deciding I would, I would be in engineering, which I did in the beginning. Uh, but I was still interested in these political issues. It had really started around, the, around my high school years and hoping I could take that passion and do something with it. Was it uh, sort of an interest in math that made engineering appealing, or was it an interest in trying to solve problems? Yeah, I just love the science of things, especially physics. I love physics the most. Uh, and so when I went to college at Purdue, I, um, I was in the engineering program. I was really liking what I was learning and finding it exciting, but still was interested in these social issues. And I had a formative experience because I decided to volunteer at a, a crisis call-in center that was run by people in the Department of Psychology, and that changed my life completely. And I decided at that point to change my major to psychology, partly because I found it really interesting and it seemed like a good outlet for this interest in the social issues, but I also just loved the people. I mean, this was a group of people who were just passionate about the world, wanting to help. They were kind, uh, smart, People, I, I, there was just so much that drew me to it. And so I switched to psychology and then sort of that drove my future from that point on. Well, that's really interesting. It's uh, you found your, you found your flock, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, well, well in that, that, uh, transition period of moving into psychology, how did you go about deciding that, well, now I need to get a doctorate, or now I need to go to graduate school. You went to graduate school at Rutgers. What, what was that like? What was that transition like for you? Well, in the college, I was taking courses in a variety of areas of psychology, but because I was involved with this crisis center, it seemed like clinical psychology would be the best fit. And then I took a course from a professor named Jim Curran, who had uh, gone to the University of Illinois, and he was trained in behavior therapy. And it was kind of the early days of that field. And um, he uh, got me really interested in behavioral approaches to psychology. And so at that point, there weren't a lot of graduate schools that specialized in that. Rutgers was one, Penn State, Stony Brook, Illinois. There weren't many. And so I applied to those programs. And I, I don't know how in the world it happened, but I got admitted to the graduate program at Rutgers. And the reason I said I don't know how it happened, because all my classmates were, you know, a lot of them were from 
Stanford and Princeton and Yale and places like that. And here I was from Purdue, which I I didn't imagine anybody ever heard of. So uh, I was pretty surprised when I got admitted, but delighted that I did. And it turned out to be a wonderful graduate school experience. So yeah, for the kid from the Aggie school kind of made it into <laughs> Rutgers uh, graduate program. It still was challenging, I guess, then. Back then, it was very competitive to get into graduate school in general and, and psychology and specifically. So even then, it was, it was a challenging. Now, did they look at your application and say, engineering? What? No. <laughs> yeah, I think somebody told me later, I asked why in the world they took me into the graduate program. Yeah. And somebody implied that they thought they'd take a chance on somebody from one of these big schools out in the Midwest. So uh, I got lucky to be that one. That's wonderful. So uh, you went on, uh, you graduated, got your uh, PhD in clinical psychology. Uh, that took you to uh, UPenn, I think, right? Before you went to Yale, you were you spent almost 10, 15 years at UPenn as an assistant professor rising through the ranks. What was that experience like and what were you challenged with back then? So uh, one, one of the very important things was my internship in clinical psychology. So I was at Rutgers working with a, a rising star in the behavior therapy field, Terry Wilson. And Terry called me into his office one day and he said, they're starting an internship program at Brown University when David Barlow was a well-known, still is obviously well-known figure in the field, was starting this internship program. And he said, how would you like to go and be in their first class? And I wasn't even thinking of doing an internship in my third year, uh, but you know, I said, sure, and, and it would be a great chance to go interact with Dave Barlow. So I agreed to do that, and I went to Providence and spent a year on internship. And then I was involved in research quite a bit with Barlow and others uh, at Brown and uh, asked Rutgers if it would be possible for me to just stay at Brown for a final year and then complete my four years of graduate school, basically with two at Rutgers and two at Brown. And thankfully, everybody was flexible enough to make that happen. And then both Barlow and, uh, and Terry Wilson knew uh, this very well-known psychiatry uh, professor at the University of Pennsylvania named Albert Stunkard. He went by Mickey Stunkard, who was sort of a godlike figure in the, the field of doing obesity research. And I was interested in that because I'd done my dissertation was on the treatment of obesity and Terry Wilson was working on those issues. And I did some studies on that at Brown. So it seemed like a good fit to go work at Penn. It was really a, a wonderful and magic time, not only because of Mickey, but because of other colleagues like Tom Wadden and Gary Foster, people that are really well-known figures in the obesity research field now those early years really kind of shaped, you know, how you were progressing and who you were making those contacts with. And even back then having an internship wasn't a thing, right? You kind of took a chance to, to do that, I suppose. Well, it, it, it was fun. It was fun taking that chance. And that was, it turned out to be a great decision in retrospect because those Brown years were wonderful. And then when I went to Penn and um, was working with Mickey Stunkard, I, I just learned so much about fields outside of psychology because he came from psychiatry and he was doing work on genetics and he was interested in animal models and a whole right. lot of things that I didn't know too much about. In fact, a humbling experience, I applied for a position at the University of Wisconsin uh, when I was on my internship and went and interviewed for a job. And there were some people there doing animal studies on obesity. And I went into that job interview thinking I knew everything about the field, which was about 25 studies in the behavior therapy literature, which are, of course, incredibly short-sighted, as, as if no discipline other than psychology even existed. Right. <laughs> yeah. So then I come across these people doing groundbreaking animal model research, and I didn't even know of it. And, and it was, uh, you know, so that opened my eyes a lot. And then Stunker did that as well. So it was a great experience and made me much more, um, a, a much broader scholar than I was going in. Yeah, that's interesting. It sort of like opened your eyes to that multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary approach and how important it is really to understanding science and the problems that we're trying to face in society, right? You know, it's, you're exactly right. And it lit, it, it, it ignited an explosion under me. I was going to say it lit a fire, but it was even stronger than that. Because I just love collaborating with other people and learning about uh, the disciplines outside my own. So 
we did a few animal studies in collaboration with people at Penn. I uh, interacted with people in physiology and pediatrics and cardiology and internal medicine and epidemiology. And all those just were, uh, they were just so intellectually interesting. And I made some really good friends in that process. And it, it was a great experience. Is there something you would have wished you would have done a little bit differently or, or something that uh, that you could have gone a different path and you ended up on that path? You know, it's a really good question. And for me, there's a clear answer. It would have been to go to law school. Uh, in, in addition to my training, not instead of my training, but in addition to it. And, and here's why, you know, after my, my, I sort of cut my teeth in my early career doing randomized trials for treatment of obesity. Um, but then a series of circumstances and some interesting things that happened in clinical settings led me to think about prevention and policy change. And that's where squarely where I am now. Uh, so I've really gone very far afield from my initial sort of clinical psychology roots. Um, and the, you know, what led me there uh, were some of these, these really profound experiences that I had, but I'm so glad I did. And now that I'm in that policy realm, and I'm thinking about how can you harness science to make changes at the broad level that affect large numbers of people at the same time. Um, you know, we, we, we default too often to thinking that legislation is going to be the answer to these things or that regulatory parts of government, like in our case, the Food and Drug Administration or the U.S. Department of Agriculture, will make the necessary changes if you only try hard enough or if you're persuasive enough in presenting them with compelling data. But that ignores the fact that corporate interests in the United States just overwhelm almost everything, less so in other countries, but clearly in the United States. And that's been clearly the case with the food industry. And in lots of other areas of public health, that's been the case too. And so, so the law, litigation in particular, becomes a really important tool that people don't think about until they exhaust these other things, which is good because they need to think about it at least at some point. But it would be great if they thought about it earlier. So for me, training in the law would have been a really good match. Yeah, and I, and I, I think that's interesting that you say in you would have done it in addition to what you've already done. But you know, not knowing that back then... Uh, and now knowing what you're doing today, how important that is, that's really, yeah, that would have been helpful back then. Um, a, 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 a lawyer psychologist. So that, that would have been a good, a good one, two punch. <laughs> well, you know, it'd be, it'd be a lawyer scientist. A lawyer way. scientist. Yeah. Because right. if you think about our work, I mean, almost all of us in the field could be making more money if we were doing something else in the private sector. So the question is, why do we do this? And, you know, the answer is usually because we want to make a difference. We want to make the world better and help people and things like that. And so the question is, how do you do that best? And in the case of scientists, you have to ask the question, does science, does science get used as well as it can in order to, does it get harnessed enough in order to really create the social and policy changes that we might be looking for? And if the answer to that is no, which it clearly is, then what can we do to try to make that connection stronger? And so how can we harness science in order to create these, these changes that we might want to create in society? And that becomes a really interesting process. How do you go about that is a, quite an interesting issue and one that we thought a lot about. So are there particular uh, examples where, you know, having a, a, a good sense of the law, a good sense of policy has really impacted uh the scientific trajectory or health in a, in a way that, that you want to share? Boy, there are a bunch of them, but I'll give you two quick examples. One is tobacco, where, you know, we knew for decades that tobacco was really a bad actor and that the companies were behaving in unseemly ways and that the public health toll was tremendous. And there were attempts early on to do legislative things to change everything, but the tobacco industry was enormously powerful. Uh, legislative things finally did happen, but one of the key uh, actions along the way were lawsuits against the tobacco industry by the state attorneys general. Those made a huge difference in public opinion. It softened the ground for legislation and regulation that came later uh, and was a really important part of this. So I'll give you one other example. Um, there's a good friend of mine at Johns Hopkins University named Steve Terrett, 
who's a public health attorney. And he he's a real hero in my mind. And he did um, the pioneering work on automobile safety. And he was interested in how many people were perishing in automobile-related accidents and tried to work with legislators to get things done, but the automobile industry was was too big and powerful. Tried to go through regulatory agencies and government like the National Highway Transportation Safety Association or whatever it is. Same thing, got stalled by the automobile industry, and he finally decided that litigation against the, the industry would be a way to go. And he decided to take on the issue of airbags because there was a number of years when the car industry had airbags, they had the technology, but they weren't putting them in cars because they thought they would raise the prices of cars too much and consumers would buy fewer cars. And so uh, he he did this, just a really impressive pioneering series of things that led to the automobile industry being sued for failure to disclose that they had this technology available, basically on the behalf of plaintiffs who had been just severely injured, disfigured, or killed in automobile accidents where they could have been saved by the airbags. And uh, it wasn't too long until the automobile industry went pleading to government, especially the Ford Motor Company, which is the one that got initially sued, uh, asking for airbags to be required in cars so that all of the companies would have to do it, not just the one that got sued. Tremend- I mean, uh, t- tens of thousands or more lives were saved by this particular action. It was really the litigation that made a difference. Yeah, the litigation and also just the investigation uh, and the science maybe that went behind it. Um, and you have some other examples, I'm sure, where you know uh, the science that we do can really inform those policy decisions and those policy choices. Um, you want to share a little bit about some of those? You know, it can be a very powerful partnership between the scientific community and policymakers. Um, and the policymakers are grateful for the kind of help that scientists can provide because, you know, not everybody in politics wants to do this, but a lot of, a lot of people want to be true to the science and, and believe in the importance of what science says uh, and would like to be informed by what goes on. And to have scientists to work with them and provide them that information can be a real valuable resource. So, uh, for example, you might find scientists, I mean, this is an issue I've been involved with for many years, wanting to use taxation as a means of improving the nation's diet, taxing things like sugared beverages, for example, which would dri- drive down beverage consumption and provide a revenue source that might be used for other you know, subsidized fruits and vegetables, let's say. So in order to do that, you need to know a whole lot of things. You need to know how much should the price be increased in order to get an appreciable change in consumption. You need to know what people will substitute if they drink less sugared beverages. Uh, You need to know if people, like if you do a, a tax in Philadelphia, for example, which has been done, how many people will drive across the bridge to New Jersey to buy their soda there and therefore thwart the tax. Uh, do people lose jobs in the soda industry? They're all, you know, there's a whole bunch of questions. All of them empirically can be addressed. And so the scientists producing the, the supporting information on these things can be enormously helpful, uh, including figuring out how much revenue could get generated by a tax. Once it would be put in, then the politicians know how much money could be raised for use for other things. And that's just one example, but there are a ton more. It's a uh, it's a little way a little different way of doing business in in our in our field or in the behavioral change behavioral science field really because it reminds me a little bit of like the work by the FDA on tobacco regulatory science right can we can we support enough science to help us inform the kinds of strategies that we should imp- imp- put into place right and and this idea of doing science um, for the benefit of informing policymakers isn't one that we're generally used to doing. I mean, we're not trained in graduate school to do it. We're not hired because we can do it. We're not promoted because we can do it. Uh, And, you know, doing something that creates an important piece of legislation that could affect millions of people, that doesn't show up in a citation index. I mean, it's just it's just not part of the the DNA of the field. So I think the field needs to change in order to accommodate this kind of work. And it's work that 
over the years when I was on the faculty at Yale, we came to call strategic research. And um, my former graduate student, Christina Roberto, who's now at the University of Pennsylvania, and I wrote a paper on strategic science. It's a little two-page paper piece in the Lancet. And it's one of the things I'm proudest of because it talks about creating a model for doing exactly this impact-driven research. And it begins with identifying the change agents uh, who can do something about the problem you're working on. It's almost never other scientists, by the way, but it's legislators, regulators, attorneys, you know, it's the school boards, it's the press, whoever it is, depending on the problem. Um, and then talking to them and working with them and finding out what information gaps exist in their world. And then we can do these studies that then can be communicated back to the change agent and you change agent. So you can get this virtual loop going that can be really pretty helpful. Um, and sometimes um, the research can be done very quickly and at very low cost and have big impact. And one of the uh, interesting public health advances that got proposed was putting calories on restaurant menus so consumers would know what they were ordering when they went to restaurants. And New York City was the first jurisdiction to put this into place. Uh, the food industry fought it tooth and nail, sued the industry up and down, and finally, finally the city prevailed and put this in. And you hope with any public health advance like this that somebody goes first, then a lot of people go second, third, and fourth, and all of a sudden you have a lot of people affected. So the state of California was considering this, but the governor at the time uh, said the only way he would sign legislation was if the public health community and the a restaurant community could agree on the language of the legislation. And in this horse trading process that ensued, the industry wanted to exempt drive-in windows from the need to have the information. And the rationale they used was there's only so much information on these boards as if they couldn't build a bit bigger board. But that's what they said. Um, and I was talking one morning to somebody in California. It was about 10 o'clock my time, 7 o'clock theirs. He was up early worked for a major advocacy organization there. And he was telling me about this. And as I was thinking about it, I thought, boy, if they get that exemption, there are a lot of people that would be missed by the intended effects of this intervention because there are a lot of people that go through these drive-in windows. So I canceled some noon meetings that day and I got a clipboard and I sat across the street from a McDonald's in Guilford, Connecticut. And I just counted the number of people who walked in or drove in. And it wasn't high science. It was just me and my clipboard. But, you know, I was there for a couple hours and it was about 60 percent of the people were driving in rather than walking in. So then my graduate students, led by Christina Roberta, who I mentioned earlier, and Marie Bragg and some others took this on. And they did a proper study with reliability checks and thousands of observations, et cetera. And at the end of the day, it came pretty close to, you know, about 60 percent. So then this information went right back to the advocacy group who then talked to legislators and said, you can't grant this exemption because you missed 60 percent of the people. And all of a sudden, legislation was was changed. Now, this wasn't this. The, the question that we asked wasn't driven by other scientists who said in their papers, this is a good next study to do. It was driven right by the advocacy community. It might have cost $50 and some clipboards, and it took a couple of weeks to do. But boy, what, what impact it had. And so that would be an example of a strategically done study. Yeah, that's really fascinating, that strategic scholarship or strategic science that you're talking about to inform um, high-impact results, really. And um, you know, a lot of things that we face in today's society, like the social determinants of health and, and, and how we can improve um, uh, health among those that are more disadvantaged, there are a lot of policy-related issues that, uh, I guess, perpetrate these or, or make these uh, more ingrained and harder to address. So this is a good example of how maybe strategic scholarship could help with some of these other issues. Have you thought about that a little bit, too, in terms of how do we impact um, those that have been uh, marginalized by policies, if you, if you will? Yeah, it's such an important issue that you raise. I, I mean, there are very few that are that could rival it in in importance. You know, in, in our work uh, on food systems, especially on food insecurity, we work very closely with a community organization here in Durham called Communities in Partnership, 
And through this, I've learned, and I mean, I've basically been schooled by members of the community about historical relationships between communities and institutions like universities and foundations, um, how uh, power and wealth get transferred in these interactions away from communities and into the institutions, um, and how uh, programs very rarely meet the needs of the communities, even though those of us in the institutions feel like we're doing something good. And so learning how to think about things differently, like who owns intellectual property, uh, who becomes PI on grants, uh, where does money flow, all these things become really important in this context. And so thinking about how communities are adversely affected uh, by, in terms of the, the problems that we care about is really important. But it's really important as well, of course, to think about how policies or interventions can maximally benefit the communities involved. And a lot of that involves, um, it, it necessitates hearing the ideas from the community about how these problems should be solved. Instead of us thinking we have solutions and then finding a community in which to test these, it makes a lot more sense to get ideas from the community about what might get tested in the first place. And like you said, using some of those same methods that have been so successful for some of the other ways of which we've informed or changed policy through science in, informing that. So that's really that's really fascinating. So let's go back a little bit to when you were president. And um, that was in 88 and 89. And um, I guess the types of questions that people were asking in the field back then in SBM um, were different maybe in some respects than – the types of questions people are asking now, or maybe uh, you've, you've seen a lot. So tell us what what was happening back then in 1988, 89, and you were, you were president right before uh, Dr. Stunkard was president too. So uh, that must have been interesting as well. It was. Um, you know, it was a fascinating time. I, in preparation for this podcast, I wanted to go back and look at the list of of presidents back at that time. And I noticed that I, I was the 10th president of this, of the society. And so it was 10 years into the, the field. Um, I mean, there were more years, of course, because some, a lot of years preceded the uh, creation of the society, but 10 years into the life of the society. And there was still a lot of attention to just getting established as a field. I mean, how do we, how do we make sure our work gets known and, how can it be credible and how can people in other disciplines start thinking of the work we do as compelling, important things that should be paid attention to? Now, of course, that's long been accomplished and that, that allowed the field to turn its attention to really important issues like how can we create maximum impact? Um, how can we grow the field? How can we get young scientists across a variety of disciplines involved in this? How can we create journals that, um, you know, and annual meetings and things like that that bring people together in the most productive ways? And so the society has gone in all those interesting directions and I think accomplished those things beautifully. And, you know, the society has become even more multidisciplinary than it was in the beginning. In the beginning, it was psychology, psychiatry, and a few people from medicine, but that was about it. And now there are people from all kinds of disciplines involved in this process. And that's very exciting. So it's been fun to see the field mature, uh, to see the field accepted into the main line of what we, you know, around these human problems that we deal with, um, and to see how many people are excited about that. That's, that makes it really fun. Tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, I, okay, I read Wikipedia. It says that you coined the term toxic food environment. Is that, is that true? I don't know if that's true or not, but you have discussed toxic food environment. Why would you use such a term like that? This thing sounds like it's coming from environmental science or something like that. But it, what, what led you to think about our food environment as toxic and why would you use that? And then where – how did that thinking kind of change what you've been involved in and how that's changed your career? We started using that term toxic and food environment all going back 
30 years, maybe more. And at that point, we were thinking about obesity and other nutrition-related chronic conditions like heart disease and diabetes. And uh, the field really made a profound change from thinking about this as a personal problem, just personal failing that people had and lack of willpower, et cetera, uh, to thinking about it more as a medical issue and then later as a, as a public health corporate-driven issue. And so that's, that's the way I was thinking about this. And it occurred to me that people are exposed to a food environment that pretty much guarantees that they're going to get sick. Now, not everybody gets sick from it, just like tobacco. You have a toxic environment with tobacco and cigarettes being pushed, uh, less so today, obviously, than before. But at that point, it was, it was really pretty serious. Um, and people, there are plenty of people who get sick and die from this. And so the same thing was true of the food environment. And the food environment was being driven by practices of the food industry. And so it seemed to me that toxic was a strong but merited word at that point, because you, if you take this environment, you put it into a culture, people get sick from it in very large numbers, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. Um, and this, this little, there was a hypothesis that was getting tested again and again around the world as countries began adopting westernized diets. The food industries became more powerful. Things like sugared beverages, sugared cereals, fast foods and things invaded these cultures. Lo and behold, the same thing happened to them in terms of their health and the prevalence of these problems that happen in the U.S. And so when you get a predictable consequence from toxic agents and people get sick from it, then using a word like toxic seem merited. So if you, if, as I was thinking about things in that way, the question is, okay, what do you do about it? I mean, this is not a problem that you can treat very effectively. I mean, now there are some new drugs on the scene and people are excited about those, um, but they're very expensive. Not everybody can get access to them. And they may have long-term consequences we don't know about yet. So this is a problem that just screamed out to be prevented. It was a, it was a problem like tobacco that, sure, with people getting lung cancer, you want to have good treatments for them. But the, the key to having less lung cancer is stopping the toxic agents in the environment. And the same thing seemed to apply to food. So the question was, can we identify the particular behaviors and activities of the industry and the food environment in general that were driving this? And then could policies and practices be put into a place to directly attack those things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a good, the, the tobacco industry uh, model and how that was applied uh, is a very good analog to what you were doing there. But it was kind of probably developing co-currently um, in a lot of ways because we've been dealing with the toxic food environment for many years. Well, I'm glad you brought up tobacco because... I, I learned so much from people in the tobacco field. Um, now, there were people in my field that said, oh, there's, it's, it's not a good parallel because you don't have to smoke and you have to eat and the tobacco companies are different from the food companies. Well, they're not. I mean, they, you know, these companies behave in pretty predictable ways. Um, and for there was a while where some of the food companies were owned by the tobacco companies. So there's, there's a lot more overlap than you might think. But one, you know, I started reading things by economists who were working on tobacco and social scientists who were working in the field. And I learned tremendous amounts from them. I'm so grateful for the work they did that, that came before what we did. Yeah. And I, I think it probably took a, a mind of a behavioral scientist or someone who recognizes that our behavior is not always the function of just our choices or individual choices that it arises within a context. Right. And so I think that's, um, you know, that's, what's wonderful about our field is that we recognize that the context matters. Mm, I agree. That's, that is one really wonderful feature of our field. You've, uh, shifted some of your, uh, work, um, you know, you were, uh, Dean at Duke and now you've shifted really to this new role. Well, during the time I was dean of the School of Public Policy at Duke and enjoyed that a lot. But at the same time, we established a World Food Policy Center. And uh, the goal of the center was to work at the intersection of food insecurity, obesity, um, and several other 
uh, important problems like agriculture and environment, for example. And there weren't many people around the world who were trying to bring all this together. And these really were global issues because what happens outside the U.S. is really important to us and vice versa. So thinking globally is a good thing. Um, and then um, it became too much to be dean and direct the center. So I decided to go where my passion was, which was direct the center, which I then did for some time. And uh, now I've turned over the directorship of the center and I'm director emeritus of it. And now I'm off working on projects that I'm really very passionate about. So staying active in the field, but just not the, the director of the center. Um, but the, the center continues to do that work at the intersection of these various problems. And I think it's really important to think broadly about these things. And as you said, to consider the context for, um, for the choices that people are provided in their lives and how that affects their behavior and in turn affects their health. And to think more than they're just sort of personal choices in this, but what are the corporate determinants of health, the social determinants of health and the like, and then what can be done about those and how can a scientist help uh, move that process ahead by connecting the science with these big policy changes. As you're sort of thinking about this next generation of scientists or behavioral medicine scholars, um, what are they going to be challenged with? Uh, what are the big things that they're going to have to work on? It's not your work anymore. It's 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 their work. What are they going to? What's what's going to be their biggest challenge? You think? You know, the world's problems have been changing with time, and you know, back when I was president of SBM in those early years, nobody talked about climate change, for example. And of course, now it's a massive issue. You know, some say the most important issue of all. It's hard to argue with that. So thinking about how the people involved in behavioral medicine can productively work on issues that are really the most important to society, like climate change, I think becomes really very important. Now, that's different than the way we've usually gone because, you know, we usually care about a specific problem, like a group of people care about heart disease and other people about cancer and other people about diet and others about exercise. And we tend to be kind of problem focused in terms of the health diagnoses. But thinking about broader things like climate change, I think will be a, a really important place for the field, way for the field to go. Now, thankfully, some people are doing this. Um, you know, one of my former student, graduate students, uh, Alyssa Eppel, who is now a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, has led an effort uh, to think about how uh, behavioral medicine work can get applied in the area of climate change. And she's written a paper that's about to be published in the journals of a number of the associations, which I think is really important advance. And there's work that can be done in all kinds of levels about making the general public more sensitive to the importance of climate change. Message framing research can be very important in this respect. Uh, and then, of course, thinking about particular policies and how they can be informed by science becomes an important part of that, too. So to me, I, I see the, the field having tremendous promise for working on these big problems. And, I'm, and so many young people care about these problems that I'm thinking more and more that those connections uh, will just be as natural as can be. So tell me, Dr. Brunel, you've had a lot of accolades. You've had a lot of awards. Um, you know, there's got to be something that you're most proud about. Uh, in terms of what you've, what you take pride in, um, I, I look through your CV and I, I see honor, 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 honor. There's so many, too many to count. I'm not going to name them all because I don't want to embarrass you. But tell me, tell me from your perspective, what is it that you're most proud of? Well, you bring a smile to my face when you ask that question because it's an easy one to answer, and it's uh, my students. Um, over the years that I've been able to work with is just the one I'm most proud of. You know, I've worked with a ton of undergraduate students who then have gone on to do amazing things. But if I think about my graduate students over the years, they're they're off just doing incredible work and are superstars in the field. And I, you know, I can't imagine being more proud of anything than I am of them. And I mentioned earlier Christina Roberto, who's at Penn, Marie Bragg at NYU, Allie Crum, who's at Stanford, Jenny Thomas, who's at uh, Harvard, uh, Rebecca Perry, you know, and my colleagues uh, Marlene Schwartz and Rebecca 
pool who are at university. I could go on and on and on. These people are just amazing. And I and Ashley Gearhart at the University of Michigan, a leader on the issue of food and addiction. Uh, you know, I could talk for hours about how good these folks are, but I just wanted to say how enriched I've been by working with them. I've learned a lot from them and it's wonderful to see them thrive. So that it, that's easily the thing about my career I'm most proud of. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, they, they probably will, will say, will say, say great things about you as well. And what a great mentor you are um, to have, you know, launch their careers and help them uh, along their careers. And even now, probably they still call you, I'm sure. Um, but you have, <laughs> what about the uh, uh, personal, uh, so people are, uh, some of the young people that are coming out, they're just finishing their PhDs, they're moving into the field. What kind of advice would you give them uh, uh, knowing that you you kind of had a circuitous route to getting to where you were at, not too much, but you went, you thought you were going to be in an engineering, and then you kind of moved. What what advice would you give them to as they move move through their early career? I guess it would be to have a thoughtful, mindful uh, discussion with themselves about what kind of impact they'd like to ultimately create. You know, our, our, field, our field thinks of impact, especially those of us involved in science, our field thinks of impact as citation indices, H index, and things like that. And, you know, to the outside world, that would seem like a bizarre definition of impact about how much do other people cite your work. I mean, you know, does that mean it's making a difference in the world? Is it helping anybody? Is it changing anything? Well, we don't ask those questions. We just have our sort of little field internal things where we all help each other and cite each other and invite each other to meetings and things like that. And there, that's not that's not a bad thing necessarily because some very good science gets produced because of that. And that science can become foundational for a lot of things. So I don't want to poke fun at that, that kind of programmatic uh, approach to research, I think, can be important. But that's only one form of impact, and it's not satisfying for everybody. So if your definition of having impact is is different than that, and it means, you know, trying to change things on a big policy scale or changing the law or whatever it happens to be, then the question is what sort of training and what sort of experiences will best take you there, sometimes a joint degree, uh, between whatever you're getting in public health or public policy or law or whatever it happens to be can be a really beneficial thing to do. But just interacting with those other fields can really take you a long way toward that goal. And then you can think about how your skills fit uniquely in this picture of overall social change, how it becomes part of the overall picture of change. Not the only part, but it can be an important part. And how can that best take place? And I think those are good discussions to have. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. It's it's good to reflect on what kind of impact you want your work to make. And, you know, I often think that we get like you said, we get too caught up in the impact factor and not not what we do and how that matters um, to the people that we that we live with in our communities and, and in our world. So that's a very good point. You know, if if we want the world to pay attention, then the question is we have to provide something of value to the world. And some of that might be the harnessing of science in order to to get the attention of change agents, uh, you know, the, the policymakers or elected leader, whoever it happens to be. We can think about who those people are that we'd like to get the attention of. And then how can we my how, how can we intentionally produce information that's valuable to them? Yeah, you know, we can't just do our work, throw it over the fence and hoping there's somebody on the other side that is going to catch it and do something with it who is in a position to make a difference. It's got to be more planful than that. And so thinking about who's in a position to do something about a problem, how can we do work that's valuable to them and then figure out how to create lanes of communication so we're interacting with those people, I think, can really make a difference. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, Dr. Brunel. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Uh, we really appreciate all that you have done and you're doing. And um, so I'd like to say thank you from SBM. Well, thank you. It was really wonderful to stay connected with the society. And um, it, it's just so exciting to see where it's going. So thanks for involving me. I really appreciate the opportunity. 
And that brings us to the end of another insightful episode of SBM's Buzz and Behavioral Medicine. A huge thanks to Dr. Brunel for sharing his journey and wisdom with us. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to Dr. Brunel's articles and relevant SBM resources. As we reflect on our conversation and anticipate the future of behavioral medicine, remember, it's our collective drive, passion, and curiosity that will shape the course of the future of behavioral medicine. I'm Dr. Bernard Femmler, reminding you that behavioral minds matter. Keep doing the good science you do and the science that does good. Remember to like, follow, subscribe to receive notifications.